join me by opening your Bibles to Psalm 13. Psalm chapter 13 is our focus this morning. Now, admittedly, I should be doing sermon number eight in the Define series, and I decided to skip it. And the reason I'm skipping it is because it's about mission, witness, evangelism. That's sort of hard to do during social distancing. And uh, I thought if you're part of the small groups, you can still study the video. And this morning, we will focus our minds and our hearts on Psalm 13. Under the theme, confidence in chaos. Here is the word of the Lord. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. May God bless his beautiful and holy word. Will you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for Psalm 13, penned by David, inspired by your spirit, and now the light that shines on our path. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to believe the good news of the confidence that we can have in chaos because of your gospel, your Son, and our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Friends of Jesus, In the mid-17th century, they were hard days in England. There was a campaign to divest England from the British monarchy. And since the monarchy was connected to the Church of England, it was particularly difficult for churches and pastors. Monasteries were emptied. Baptismal fonts were removed from the churches. People regularly defamed the clergy. Everything was done to disengage the church and its influence and its witness from the culture. Those were tough times. In the midst of that story, there is a church in a town called Stoughton, England. And there is an inscription on the church that says this. In the year of 1653, when all things sacred were throughout the nation destroyed or profaned, this church was built to the glory of God by Sir Robert Shirley, whose singular praise it was to have done the best things in the worst times. That's confidence in the midst of chaos to do the best things in the worst of times. You and I can look at what's going on in our world, in our culture today, and we would say these are troubled times. They're troubled times politically, they're troubled times morally, they're troubled times economically, they're troubled times physically for a whole lot of reasons, only one of which is COVID-19. And not only are these troubled times, but these are sad times. When I do think of COVID-19, it seems more and more the reality of the scope of this virus is settling in. We're hearing about more infections and death. And there's a sadness within people's hearts about what is taking place. And how do we live with confidence in the midst of that chaos? How do we do the best things in the worst of times? 
We ask that question in the light of Psalm 13. David, the king, was facing serious illness. In fact, the suggestion in verse 3 is that it may even be close to being fatal for him. Whatever this illness is, it's likened to an enemy. And yet, when you read this psalm, it teaches something really important to us. To use the words of the late Louis Smedes, he said, this psalm actually teaches that everything is all right even when everything is all wrong. This is a psalm to to develop faith in troubled times. It's a psalm intended to give us confidence in the midst of chaos. Because when you read the psalm carefully, it simply says there is a joy reserved for us. And that future joy defines the way we live in the present. That future joy reserved for God's children is a joy that allows us to live with faith and faithfulness and joyfulness to the glory of God. And I invite you this morning to discover that confidence in the midst of chaos, to do the best things in the worst of times. When I look at the psalm, I just want you to think of three words. The first word is cry. The second word is care. And the third word is confidence. I hope you have your Bibles open. Think of that first word, cry. It's captured in verses 1 and 2. Let me read it again to you. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And maybe when you hear that question asked three times, how long, you're hearing uncertainty, anxiety, fear. After all, David is talking about three audiences when he asks the question three times. He says, how long, Lord? And he feels neglected by God. For whatever reason, his illness or the challenges surrounding it, he feels neglected by God. And he also talks to himself. How long, Lord, must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? All of his thoughts, all of his plans, all of his emotions, things aren't working out the way he wants, the way he had hoped, the way he had dreamed. And he can't save himself. He can't help himself. And that only adds to the angst and the anxiety. And then he makes a third audience and he talks about the enemy. How long will my enemy triumph over me? And most people here say the enemy is not the sickness. The enemy is actually Satan who is using the sickness to just pester with David's mind. to make him question God's love, to make him question God's faithfulness, to make him question his own sense of security and joy and hope. And I sometimes wonder if that isn't the way we're experiencing life today. I think of kids at home learning online and having to navigate that and teachers navigate that, and we get agitated with each other, and we get a little cranky because things aren't going the way they are, and we have to spend so much time together. Or the stress it puts on our businesses, or the stress it puts on churches, or the stress that so much of life is putting on people today, and it seems so all out of control. It's easy to ask how long. But if I were to end right there, I would not be helping you. 
Because this question, how long, asked three times, is actually not about uncertainty, anxiety, or fear. How long is actually about confidence. Because the psalmist is not asking in his cry if the Lord will listen, if the Lord is interested. He's just asking, when is it going to end? We know you're in control. We know you're the king. We know your story. How long, Lord? John Calvin said that this word, these two words, how long, is actually the most confident exercise of faith. Because the person who has faith in God and Jesus Christ does have the courage and does have the audacity to look at his track record and say, okay, Lord, this is out of character for you. So how long? Martin Luther got even more direct and he said, this confidence is actually a confession that God has robbed Satan of his song of triumph. The enemy thinks he can pester with us. The enemy thinks he can rattle us. The enemy thinks he can dethrone faith from us. But this question, how long, says Luther, is actually in the face of Satan and saying, do you know my God? The God to whom I cry out, do you know his track record? He will act. It's not a question if, it's only a question when. And so we look at these questions, this cry of verses 1 and 2, how long, O Lord? And the cry is not a complaint against God. The cry is not a resignation to evil. The cry is not a form of spiritual trauma. The cry is not a lack of faith. The cry is a recognition that in our journey with the Lord Jesus Christ, we will always have dark, lonely, and trying times, but we cry out to the him who made a promise that he would not abandon the work of his hands, and we say to the Lord, how long? Are your hands ready to intervene in my life, in this world, in this situation? We can say that because of what is said in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. They know there's a joy reserved for them. And it was their joy of the future, the joy that God had reserved for them, that gave them confidence to live in the moment, in the day. That's confidence in the midst of chaos. It's to cry out to God. That's to do the best things in the worst of times, is to trust his promise and cry out to him, not if, but when. Second word is the word care. David cries out to God, and then in verses 3 and 4, he is introduced to the care of God. Listen to the words. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. You may be saying, where do you see the care of God in those words? Well, let me help you. Look on me, answer me, give light to my eyes. And do you notice something? That the question is never answered? There is silence. There is silence from God. And let me just say this, that this is a beautiful gracious silence that God gives us. David cries out, we cry out. And you say, well, how can that be gracious, this silence of God? 
Because the silence of God is intended for us to step back, to reflect, and to discern who he really is. Discern his character. Look on me. Answer me. Give light to my eyes. Do those words ring a bell? Do they take us back to Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, that describes the character of God? There it says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. God sees and God hears and God is concerned and God comes down to rescue and God brings them up and now step back and ask yourself the question, how did he do it? How did this character come alive? The answer of the Bible is in the true and better David, Jesus Christ. Jesus came because the Father sees. Jesus came because the Father hears. Jesus is the concern of the Father for his children. Jesus is the one who has come down to rescue us, and Jesus is the one who will bring us up I like the line that is given in this verses 3 and 4. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Friends, that is the essence of the gospel. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And he's giving light to our eyes in these words to say, Do you see my son? You don't have to sleep in death because he has. I've shared with you before that when Jesus gets to the Garden of Gethsemane and he himself prays to the Father, most commentaries believe, commentators believe that what he hears is simply the silence of of the Father. There's nothing that he gets back. And then he gets on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer of the rest of the Bible is this. Because the Father has seen, and the Father has heard, and the Father is concerned, and the Father has come down in Christ in order to bring us up. And when Jesus is raised from the dead, says Paul, we are raised with him to a new life, a joy that was reserved for us from eternity, a gift of the Father. We are his treasured children. Did the Father look? Did he answer? Did he give light? And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 says, So let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorned its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And then 1 Corinthians 15, death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the worst thing that can ever happen to us? I've asked this question before. It's not illness. It's not the coronavirus. It's not even death. It is eternal separation from the Father. And yet the best thing that happens to us is the fact that he is seen and he is heard and he is concerned and he has come down in Christ and he lifts us up. Jesus slept in death. 
so that we will always be secure in the hands that are calloused with grace. The joy of Jesus is the joy that is reserved for us by the love of the Father. That's confidence in chaos. And to hold that faith is to do the best things in the worst of times. And so David not only cries out, and in verses 3 and 4, he not only sees the care of the Father, but then in verses 5 and 6, he expresses his confidence in the midst of this chaos. Let me read it to you. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. He trusts because of the character of unfailing love. And he has joy. I'm going to rejoice in salvation. I'm going to sing to the Lord because of his great work. It's not a question of if God will function according to character. It's only when. And David has not even received his answer yet, and he is filled with gratitude and joy and delight for the joy that is reserved for him. I just want to take you to two quotes, both by John Calvin, who commenting on these verses, said the first thing we need to recognize is the providence of God to acknowledge in the midst of all of our afflictions and troubles that God really cares about us. But it's true that to say God really cares about us is not the usual way with human beings or what we always feel. But we are called to see the providential hand of God. I will trust him. What you have to understand, friends, is that the joy reserved for us of the future that defines our life today will never tell us what the roadmap to that destination looks like. It simply means that God in his gracious providence, God in his gracious character, will not let anyone strip away from us the eternal joy that he has reserved for his children. And if he needs to take us through difficult times to awaken within our hearts that hope for eternal joy, then so be it, is the point of the psalmist. I will still trust him. But then Calvin says there's a second thing. He says that David is convinced and therefore David pledges himself to give thanks and even though he has not received the answer to his prayer, he says this, we may not be wholly free from sorrow yet, but it is nevertheless necessary that this cheerfulness of faith rise above it and put into our mouth a song, an account of the joy which is being reserved for us in the future in anticipation of the joy reserved for him, David today says, I'm going to lift up songs of gratitude and joy to God for all that he has done and will do. Because there is a joy reserved for God's children. That's confidence in chaos. That's the best things in the worst of times knowing that a church in England, knowing that you and me can build our lives today because of a future joy that says the trees of the field will clap their hands, the mountains will sing for joy, all creation will give birth to the praise of God, and you and I will join in that day when all things are made new. Isn't that great? So I wonder, when I think of cry and care and confidence, will it be said of you and me that we have done the best things in the worst of times? That we have had that faith and that faithfulness to the glory of God regardless of our circumstances? 
And as you ask that question for yourself, I think of it in terms of a familiar hymn, and we're going to end the message by singing the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. But let me tell you a little bit about this hymn. To fully appreciate the beauty of the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, the story is stirring. The author of this hymn is Martin Rinkhart, a Lutheran pastor in the town of Eilenburg, Germany. And he faithfully served the people of his church during the Thirty Years' War of 1618 to 1648. It was one of the deadliest religious wars in history, leaving some eight million people dead. But this town of Eilenburg, Germany, was a walled city. And a lot of people came and sought refuge in that place. As a result, food became scarce and eventually there was extreme poverty. People were hungry and poor and crammed into the city. And then the worst of things happened. The plague struck with deadly force in 1637. There were four pastors in Eilenburg, Germany. By the end of the first year, one had abandoned his church and the other two had passed away and Pastor Rinkhart presided over their funerals. It is said that approximately 8,000 people died that year. One year, 8,000 people in one small city. And Pastor Rinkhart conducted all of the funerals, sometimes up to 50 a day, including the funeral of his own wife. And at the end of that year, he wrote a hymn. Let's sing it together.